Well, good morning, Walden Church. My name is David. I am the senior pastor here. And sometimes I get to share my story. I was uh, born and raised in Sacramento, California. And for uh, some of my youth, I went to my grandmother's church who attended a Presbyterian church that she helped plant. And it was a very formal church. You might call it high church today. We only sang hymns, uh, the pastor wore a robe, the choir wore robes. We did responsive readings every week. Uh, We sang the doxology, we sang the Apostles' Creed every week. Uh, Later, when I was a teenager, my parents sent me to Calvin Crest, which was a Christian camp up in Oakhurst. And sitting around my first outdoor campfire worship at night, everything changed. There was no choir. (laughs) Instead, uh, there were counselors with guitars. There were no hymns. There were new songs that I had never heard of. And then old songs being sung a new way. Kids swayed, kids put their arms around each other. They raised their hands, they closed their eyes. Some kids cried, some kids kneeled, and they were almost all smiling. I, of course, went to my Parents' church, uh, who went to a big Baptist megachurch. They later went on to a Christian Reformed church. And then during seminary, I even attended a, a black church out in L.A. And when I went, met my wife, I attended a Methodist church. And, and you know what? Everyone has different styles, different songs, different ways of doing it. But it's all worship. None of it is right or wrong. It's all worship. The book of Psalms says, I extol you, O God, my King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will will declare your greatness. Now, I'm sure I don't need to remind you that the Bible is not written in English. We read a translation. We read a book that has been changed into English so that we can understand it. In fact, a lot of our English words are really inadequate. They're not good enough because we could look at a word and say, well, that's, you know, what, what, what's that word? And someone might say, well, that's love. I'm like, okay, but what's that word? Well, that's also love. Because there are eight Greek words for love. And they all mean something different. In English, I could say, I love french fries. And I love my wife. We use the same exact word, but in context. And in context, you understand, I don't mean the same thing. The eight ancient Greek words for love are eros, which is romantic, passionate love, philia, which is affectionate love, agape, which is selfless, universal love, storge, which is familiar love, mania, which is obsessive love, ludus, which is playful love, pragma, that's enduring love, and felucia, which is self-love. But today's passage is from the Old Testament. So this is Hebrew, and we're talking about worship, and we're going to talk about praise. And I thought, you know what, let's just spend some time looking at the seven words in Hebrew for praise. And hopefully, by the end of this, we can have a new appreciation and maybe even a new response to worship. The first worship word is yada. Yada means this. It means extended hands. It's the same word that you would use if you were talking about throwing a spear or shooting an arrow. Psalm 145.10 says, All your works, yada, you. Lord, your faithful people extol you. Yada is the picture of a three-year-old that's running across the room with their arms up, saying, Daddy, pick me up. Yada is a cry for help, but it's also praise when it comes from desperation, and it's also praise when there is victory. Yada is also translated sometimes as giving thanks. Not to mention that all across the world, raised hands is the universal symbol for surrender, right? So when a worshiping person raises their hands, 
in adoration, in thanks, in surrender to their God. This is a biblical response. And you might be like me, you might say, well, I'm not a raise my hands person. I, I rarely do it. I'm always looking around to see, are other people doing it? Is this a safe place to do it? I remember once when I went to a, a third day concert, uh, they're probably my favorite worship band, and I was at an outdoor stadium, and I don't know what happened. I think it was the combination of knowing all the words and then being around like-minded people that I just remember losing myself and raising my hands the whole night. I raised my hands every year that I went to youth group. And for those of you who raise your hands more often than the rest of us, I bet you agree. It's for when you just have to praise him. You feel like if you don't raise your hands, then your bones will tear through your skin and do it for you. And you're not worried about the other people around you. You don't care what anybody else thinks. Raising your hands, this is what you do when you celebrate. This is what you do when your team scores a touchdown. This is what you do when you shout, surprise, to people who are having their birthday. You want the singer on stage to notice you. And it's also when you're having so much fun on a roller coaster. Raising hands is an expression of joy and of thanks and of surrender. Your second word is Hallel. Hallel is where we get the word Hallelujah, right? Hallelujah is probably the premier word for worship and praise in the Bible. And really, hallelujah transcends language because we don't translate hallelujah, we transliterate it, which means that we copy the spelling, but we don't find a word that's our own word. It's, it's like when we say fiance. We don't have an English word for fiance, so we just say fiance. It's like when we say hors d'oeuvres. We don't have an English word for that, so we just say hors d'oeuvres. So we don't have an English word for hallelujah. So we don't fully get it. Hallel means to boast or to brag on. It means to make a show, even to the point of looking silly, looking ridiculous. It literally means praise the Lord. Psalm 145 says, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be Hallel, and his greatness is unsearchable. Hallelujah is this spontaneous outcry of somebody who is so excited about God. It's only used 24 times in the Old Testament and only between Psalm 104 and Psalm 150. It's reserved for times of extreme exaltation, like dancing. Psalm 150 says, praise the Lord, praise the Lord in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Do you see the picture? <laughs> praises, praises, praises everywhere. All places, all instruments, all people, loud, noisy, dancing, sing, yell. We don't understand. We just don't understand what hallelujah is. Because hallelujah is not, I lost my car keys and then I prayed and then I found them. And then your friend says, hallelujah. That's not hallelujah. That is not what hallelujah means, okay? It's like when your friend says something funny on, the, on, your, on your text, and then you text back, L-O-L. But you didn't really laugh out loud. So your face does not match your thumbs. Hallelujah means that you worship like David. Or better yet, you worship like a three-year-old who's been given a wooden spoon and a pot. And you just go nuts, go berserk. It's an epic foolishness of running around and screaming. Psalm 69 says, I will praise the name of God with song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than ox or bull with horns and hoofs. Have you ever been to a Jewish wedding? Have you ever been to a Jewish wedding? A Jewish wedding is full of Hallel. There are no spectators. Nobody sits. Nobody watches. 
A Jewish wedding is a full contact sport. <laughs> Everyone participates. Everyone celebrates. Why? Because these two people who we love now love each other because these two separate families are now one combined family. It's a word that is just full of happiness, joy, participation, excitement, movement, energy. It's even the last word in the book of Psalms. Psalm 150 says, let everything that has breath, hallel, hallel. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. We should not be able to say hallelujah with a straight face. We should not be able to sing hallelujah with a straight face. In worship, we say, sing with me. Sing for the years. Sing for the laughter. Sing for the tears. Hallelujah means more cowbell. And don't worry that it's not good enough for anyone else to hear. Just sing. Sing a song. Hallelujah says, I'm singing, I'm in a store, and I'm singing. Third word, Shabbat. Shabbat is like it sounds. It means to shout. Psalm 145 says, One generation shall commend your works to another and shall shout your mighty acts. Who is this verse for? It's for us. This is for boomers. This is for Gen Xers. All of us older, classic folks. We are supposed to shout. To who? To the youth. Psalm 145 says, you have to shout to the kids. Shout about how real God is, how great God is. Shout what God has done in your life. We, we can no longer hope that somebody else is gonna shout for us because the Bible says we are supposed to shout the gospel. We are supposed to shout God's love. Why? Because if we don't shout the truth, if we don't scream it at the top of our lungs, the world will shout louder than you. And the world will shape our youth with its own values. And we cannot stand idly by and allow the gospel to be suffocated or drowned out. We must shabak. Isaiah 42 says, The Lord goes out like a mighty man, like a man of war. He stirs up his zeal. He cries out. He shouts aloud. He shows himself mighty against his foes. Shabak is the roar of God's people, of people who are excited, of people who are on fire. Think about sports, right? Think about just this past year when the Astros won the World Series, right? I mean, because what is that? What is baseball? It's a, it's a very slow, boring game that involves a little small white leather ball. And one man stands in the middle of everybody else, and he tries to throw that ball faster than your car drives down the road and then another man catches it. But there's a third man who has a stick of wood and he really wants to hit the ball, but he rarely does. And if he's beyond lucky, occasionally he'll hit it. And then when he does, everybody's shocked because like I said, it doesn't happen that often. And so in his joy, he puts the stick down and then he runs around and tries to touch specific areas of the field. And when he's done running, he gets to sit down and relax for a very long time. And then, what happened even a few years before this? The Cubs won the World Series. And everyone went berserk because it had been 108 years since Chicago won the World Series. That means people had lived. They'd been, they had born and died. They had lived their entire lives and never seen the Cubs win the World Series. And when you watch clips of, of people responding, whether they're at home or in bars, or at the stadium, they just, they just lose it and they shout. They scream at the top of their lungs. And that's just one sport. That's just one team in one sport. What about us? Can, can we be that excited each week? I mean, every Sunday, you get to sing and praise and remember that there is a God who is so loving, so gracious, that he sent his only son to live for you to die for you, but then he resurrected, he beat death, and he sacrificed himself, and he washed away all of your sins, and now you get to receive eternal salvation, but not because of any good works that you do, but solely because you believe. And we get to live with him, promised 
for all eternity. That's got to be better than the Astros winning the World Series. That's got to be better than the Cubs winning the World Series. Psalm 145 says, if you are older, you have a responsibility to shout to the next generation. And, and if you're a younger generation, you also have a responsibility. You should shout back, I got this. I got this, you ran with the baton, now I've got it. Thank you for running earlier, we will take it from here. Fourth word, zamar. Zamar means to pluck the strings of an instrument. It sounds kind of like a Dr. Seuss instrument, doesn't it? What is that weird instrument? It is a zamar. It rhymes with a guitar. So worship is not just about our feet moving or our voices yelling, but it's also about our fingers strumming. Apparently, we need backup, right? We need a soundtrack. There is something very powerful about music, isn't there? Even the Bible highlights it with stories like David playing the harp to soothe the soul of King Saul. More recently, music therapy has been used successfully with war veterans and people suffering from PTSD, people who suffer from abuse. Music reduces stress. It strengthens your circulation. It can even strengthen your immune system. People often turn naturally to music and other creative arts when they choose to express themselves, express their emotions. We might encourage a child to enter music lessons and we'll say, it's a fun activity, but it has the full potential to become something so much more in that child, far reaching. Music exposure can be life changing. Hans Christian Andersen said, in situations where words fail us, music can help us speak. In short, music changes the world because it changes people. Music is the divine way to tell beautiful, poetic things to the heart. Music is the shorthand of emotion. It is the soundtrack of your life, and it is the most famous and most popular language because music speaks of glory, right? If you want to elevate something, if you want to make something greater, you sing about it. The word zamar speaks of rejoicing. It's about the joyful expression of music. Zamar means to sing praises or to touch the strings. It's about the entire orchestra. It's about every member of the band making music and harmony together for the Lord. In 2 Kings, they're going off to battle and Elisha is prepared to give a speech. But before the troops head out, in chapter three, he says, now bring me a musician. And when the musician played, the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he said, thus says the Lord, I will make this dry stream bed full of pools. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind or rain, but that stream bed shall be filled with water so that you shall drink you, your livestock and your animals. What's happening? Elisha is preaching to a soundtrack. He's got some good, important words of inspiration and encouragement. And he says, you know what? Uh, I think this better, I think this would be way better. I think this would be cooler, actually, if I had a harpist behind me. Our fifth word is the word toda. Toda also means to shout or to address with a loud voice. But toda goes even further because it also includes an act of thankfulness for God's promised deliverance. Get this, because it's important. Even while we are still in need. What does that mean? It means you thank God for the things that you do not have. Tada is inviting God to help, but mostly it's to praise him in faith and assurance that we have his promises long before they actually come. Tada is praise and hope and thankfulness for what God hasn't done yet. That means you raise your hands in faith for your prodigal son, for your wayward daughter, for your marriage, for your addiction, for your illness, for your affliction, for employment. 
It means you thank God in your darkest hour, not in fear, but in confidence. Psalm 56 says, be merciful to me, my God, for my enemies are in hot pursuit. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God, whose word I tada, I praise. All day long, they twist my words, they conspire, they lurk, they watch my steps, hoping to take my life, record my misery. Then my enemies will turn back when I call for help. By this, I will know that God is for me. This is praise with faith for something that has not come to pass, thanking God for a prayer that has not been answered. Tada says, I trust you as my provider. I trust you as my healer. I trust you for all my direction. I trust you for my peace. I trust you as the one who makes a way when there seems to be no way. I raise my hands because I trust you. And I know that you have the whole world in your hands. The sixth word is the word Barak. Barak is submission. And it looks like the moment when your child kneels before the parent to receive the blessing. Psalm 134 says, Come bless, come Barak the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. May the Lord who made the heavens and earth bless you from Zion. Barak means that you are walking into the king's throne room, and in that moment, you do not lose focus. You do not just kind of doze off or start dreaming about something else. You realize, I'm in the king's presence. I'm in the throne room right now, and nothing is going to distract me from worship because you know where you are, and you know how important this is. It is submission. Can you imagine if we had that same attitude when we came into church? That you came into the sanctuary and You said, I am not going to break eye contact with the king. You didn't allow anything to distract you. No. Instead, we say, what? This song again? Come on. How come we don't sing more hymns? They're right there in the book. How come we don't sing more modern songs? All we do is sing hymns. You know, we need to sing uh, songs that we write ourselves. Songs that are personal to this church, original songs. Why do we sing all these original songs when there's great songs already uh, written down for us? I think they make a stand way too long in church. I think we sit way too long in church. You know, the music is really too loud. Oh, the music is really too quiet. You've probably heard all those too. And after church, we'll say, how was worship today? How was worship? What does that mean? Because does that mean that the worship depends on the choir? The worship depends on the band? No, it depends on you in your submission, right? Where your attention is. The better question is, how was my worship today? Because nobody else can give God my love. Nobody else can give God my affection. Nobody else can give God my submission. And nobody else is responsible for my praise. How was your worship this morning? The next word is the word tahila. I like that word. It's fun to say. Tahila. Tahila means to sing a song that's unrehearsed. It's spontaneous. It just comes out of you. You just start singing. Like in the movies. (laughs) You know, when you see two people in the grocery store and they just start singing and doing a choreographed dance and you're like, where did you have the time to learn that? Tehillah is a personal song. It's a song that only you can sing because it's your story. Nobody else can sing your story. It's the story of how God saved you, how God loves you. And you are singing this song because you are saying, God is faithful to me. You might even be singing somebody else's words. You're singing somebody else's words, but as you sing them, they become your words. They become your story. And you say, I once was lost, but now I found. And you, you say it with meaning because you say, this is, this, is, this is my song. You became the author of the song because somebody wrote it just for you. And you sing it with zeal and emotions and love. Psalm 22 says, you are holy enthroned on the praises, the tehillah of Israel. That's the same word. It's this, that, that verse says, 
I mean, it's crazy when you think about it. That verse says that God is in heaven. He's surrounded by perfection and everything he's made and all his glory, and he's holy, he's perfect, and then he sees people singing of their own personal thankfulness, singing their stories and their own personal testimonies, and God is so moved in that moment that he leaves heaven and he takes up his throne here with us. And he says, this is where I want to be, with these singers, with these people, with these stories. Now, we've done the work. How do we respond? Because the Bible says in 2 Timothy, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that we may be complete, equipped for every good work. The scriptures have been read. How do we respond? Now, some of us might have heard all that, and our response is, well, that's just not my personality. I get it. But <laughs> worship is not a request. It's a command. You probably would not have got very far in your career or in, in your first couple jobs if you had said, yeah, it's not my, real, it's not my personality to get dirty. I don't, I don't make food. I don't really wait on people. I mean, I, I don't like sweating. I don't like getting up early. Your boss would have said, this is not a request. The word sing appears in the scriptures over 400 times, and at least 50 of those are commands. We are clearly commanded to worship God. Psalm 95 says, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. First Chronicles states, Ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. John 4 says, The Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Romans instructs, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And, as we studied just now, worship is more than singing, more than dancing, more than yelling. It's also playing instruments. It's also reverence. That means worship is a life posture of honoring God through obedience. I usually just skip the songs and I come in late to church just to hear the message. Worship is not a checkbox. It's not an option. It's a command. Do me a favor. No, do yourself a favor. Pray this to yourself right now where you are sitting. My comfort cannot be more important than your commands. Lord, my comfort cannot be more important than your commands. Every time you come across a scripture that is hard or that you struggle to obey, my comfort cannot be more important than your commands. Even in the last days, Revelation 15 teaches that all will worship the Lord. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name, for you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. It shouldn't have to be a command. We should want to do this because of how much we love God and how he makes us feel. You know what I mean, right? You're driving down the road and a certain song comes on the radio. You know the song, Bohemian Rhapsody, Hey Jude, Hotel California, your song, I Will Always Love You, Heartbreak Hotel, Over the Rainbow, Bridge Over Troubled Water, Dancing Queen, Good Vibrations, Yesterday, Every Breath You Take, You've Lost That Love and Feeling, Dancing in the Street, Best of My Love, Sweet Caroline, and then what happens? What happens when it comes on the radio? Memories and feelings and emotions, and sights, and sounds, and smells, they all wash over you. When you hear a song, nostalgia wraps around you, and you can't help it, and you burst out into song, because the song takes you back. That's what worship is supposed to do. It is supposed to stir you. 
When I am singing, I am reminded of my own story. I once was dead in sin and transgression, and in one incredible act of love for my Heavenly Father, I was rescued, and He saved me. And music reminds me what God has done. And when we sing these songs, the words cannot be on autopilot. I have to feel them. I have to dwell on the phrases. Secretly, I think we all want to sing. I do. I think we all want to shout, and we all want to dance, and we all want to raise our hands, but we're so concerned with what other people think. Because there are these two camps, people who sing with arms up and people who sing with arms down. And, and I, I think we believe that we come from two totally different worlds. And if one day you just start to raise your hands, your friends will look over and think, oh, you've, you've, you've crossed over to the dark side. You're one, you're one of them now. Can you imagine if a visitor came in here and we were all singing with passion and we were all raising our hands and closing our eyes and we were on our knees or up on our tiptoes? What would they say? What do you think they would say? Oh, it's one of those churches. You probably don't know the name Vance Havner. Vance was ordained at 15 years old. He preached all over America. Dr. Vance Havner was a revivalist. He authored nearly 40 books during his ministry, and his unique style has impacted thousands of people through the years. Havner became one of the best loved and renowned revivalists of the 20th century. Here's what I want to show you. Vance Havner said, Sunday morning Christianity is the greatest hindrance to true revival. Ouch. If you raised your hands, or knelt, or smiled, or cried, or held the person next to you, I don't think it would have the effect that you think. In fact, I think it would have the opposite effect. I don't think we have to worry that other people will be weirded out because I think actions speak louder than words. Just like an actor, when an actor reads their lines, they can do it flat and monotone, right? With their hands glued to their sides and they just read it. Or they could use their face. They could use their eyes, they could use their hands, they could emote, they could express. And I think people would walk away from the second one saying, they convinced me. I really believed what they were saying. They really transformed into that other person. So I think anyone that walks in as a guest, as as a visitor, I think they would be more convinced, more convinced. King David writes in the Psalms, Seven times a day, I hallel you for your righteous rules. Remember that hallel is acting foolish. It's dancing. It's shouting. We see David do this most famously when he is dancing before the Ark of the Covenant. And his wife, Michael, looks on with disgust because she can't believe that a king would behave in such a way in front of his subjects. And she tells David that she's upset with his behavior. And this is how David responds. He says, I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. What did David mean by this? I think he was saying two important things here, and they are very good reminders for us. First, he was saying, I don't care what anybody else thinks. I don't even care what you think. I was dancing and celebrating because of what God has done. And if I have to, I will become even more abased. I will become even more humbled. I will make an even bigger fooler of myself because I will lower myself even lower before God. David says, I will become even more undignified than this. David's wife had a problem that so many of us share. She was concerned with looking around at everybody else and she was worried about what they would think. But David knew 
that that had nothing to do with worship. He knew that worship was between himself and God, and he didn't care if people were watching. David's wife accused him of being inappropriate in front of slave girls. And David says, no. The slave girls will watch and they will hold me in honor. I think what he's saying here is our second point, that an act of worship would move others to see that their heart is from God. And not only would they see a heart that loves God, but they would want, that they would desire that same kind of relationship with God. In other words, they wouldn't look at you and laugh. They would look and say, I wish I felt that way about God. I wish I had that trust. I wish I had that same boldness. I wish I had that same faith. And you know, worship doesn't begin just the moment you walk through those doors. Worship begins when we make that decision. I'm going to come into God's presence. And that can happen anywhere. It's that time when we seek God and we say, I'm going to spend time with him and I'm going to sing my songs and sing my prayers. And it's just you and him. It's just you and God. It doesn't matter who's watching us. It doesn't matter what others are doing. We need to worship God freely, even if it occasionally means that we are undignified. I think in those moments, we all become worship leaders because others will be led into a spirit of worship because they can see that you are in God's presence and they will want to have that same experience. Amen? Hallelujah. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, we worship you. We worship you in spirit and truth. We worship you with instruments and with dancing and singing and love and praise and joy, but mostly with a smile on our face, with tears streaming down out of our eyes. We worship you on knees. We worship you on extended toes. We worship you with our hands raised and fingers touching the ceiling. We worship you for the things that you have done, for the ways you have blessed us, for your salvation. We worship you for prayers yet unanswered. We worship you for deeds not yet done. We worship you for promises not yet fulfilled. We worship you in faith, we worship you in truth. We worship you in this place. We worship you in our hearts. Lord, may our worship be a testimony of your awesomeness. May our worship be preaching. May our worship lead others. May this house, may your house everywhere be filled with worshipers with songs, with voices, with sound, with vibration. May we worship you. May the earth worship its creator. We worship you through prayer, through reading the scriptures, through giving, through service, through extended acts of love and charity. We worship you with ourselves and with everything we are. We worship you as sons. We worship you as daughters. Amen. If you need a place to worship, we're here. We are here every Sunday and you are welcome. This is home. This is church. It's not perfect. No church is. A church is filled with broken people. A church is a hospital. It's a place where we can lean on each other and support each other and serve each other. To be encouraged and to go back out into the world to be the hands and feet of Christ. If that sounds like the kind of place that you would like to visit, we're here. We're here every Sunday. We have two services, one at 9.30. Our first service has a choir. We're gonna sing hymns. We're gonna do responsive readings. We're gonna say the Lord's Prayer and have communion. It's gonna feel just like church uh, the church that you grew up with. Our second service is at 11 o'clock. It's more relaxed. We have a worship team. Come casual. Come as you feel comfortable. We have a full children's program at that same hour from birth all the way through high school. 
and we want to be the church where you live. I love you guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.